we are back. Welcome to Crediversio's Q&A Wednesday Live. I am your host, David Mahalik, certified FICO Pro credit expert. And uh, I'm here to be your coach, answer all your questions live. And uh, let me just put a couple things up on the screen here that I forgot. Here we go. My name. Of course, I'll put up Crediversio. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I see we've got uh, about a dozen or so people jumping on, just like we do every week. We're going to open this up for Q&A. So whether you are brand new to Credit Versio, don't have Credit Versio, been with us for a long time, this is your time to ask me questions. Uh, it's just going to be us today. John is not joining us. So one of the benefits of, of it just being us is that we can talk about credit repair specifically. Those are questions we typically don't go into when John is around um, for a, a myriad of reasons, largely because he represents um, or is, is called as an expert witness for the bureaus and for um, a, a lot of big data furniture. So even though the guy really knows the subject matter in that space, it's usually something we don't talk about. And I got to swing back around and answer everybody's questions in the comments, but we don't have to do that today. So take a second, introduce yourself, say hello, don't be shy. And if you've got questions, shoot them on over. So the topic for today, I'm going to make it a short topic, and we'll go for as long as I've got questions, and maybe we'll go a little bit late, maybe we'll go a little bit shorter than we normally do. But um, here at Credit Versa, one of the things we love to do is run data on what the software is actually doing. And the um, interesting thing is, is that Credit Versio really is, a, we're a development company, we're a software company, and numbers and stats and what's going on behind the scenes is really what is really information that we want to know because it helps us to make the software even better. And now that we've been at it for what are we, uh, three, three and a half years, it, 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 I think it's three and a half years. Yeah, wow, it's a little bit longer than I thought initially. Um, it's always something that we're improving. Scott, good to see you. Hello, Tamara, good to see you. And let's see. David Fenton, I'm going on round five, I think. I've only been able to get one thing deleted. Should I still keep going? Seems like it's the same suggestion as time before. Yeah. So, uh, so David, it's a really, really good question. And one of the things that that I've always told everybody, um, in fact, I'm just quoting the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and that is that, that things get deleted under, uh, under one or more of only four set of circumstances. And that is, is the account erroneous? Meaning, is it wrong? Is there something about it that's false? Is it not supposed to be there? Is it reporting information that's wrong? So erroneous, outdated, meaning is it, has it been on there longer than what the, uh, what the statute of limitation says it's, it's supposed to be there for? So erroneous, outdated, incomplete, so pretty self-explanatory, or is it unverifiable? Now, those are the four reasons under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, most things that get deleted fall under the first two categories. Is it erroneous? Meaning, is there something wrong? Credit Versio is fantastic at finding discrepancies across the account or on the account across all three bureaus. So if there's something wrong, materially wrong about the account, then Credit Versio is gonna find it. Now, one thing that Credit Versio is not gonna know is uh, an account that maybe isn't yours. All, all that Credit Versio can see, which is the bulk of the work, is what's on the credit report. But for example, say if you've got a collection that's not legitimate, it's not yours, Credit Verso doesn't know that. It doesn't know the backstory. It's just going to try to pick apart the collection itself. So erroneous or unverifiable. Now, uh, frankly, this is the way that a lot of things just get deleted. It's, it's, it's simply the fact that it's not verifiable. The dispute goes into the data furnisher, aka creditor, and also bureau. And the creditor sometimes just has an auto-delete function, meaning that it, it knows that that certain accounts in certain conditions probably don't have the ability to verify it. And there are real penalties if they don't, meaning if they just ignore it and there's a problem with the account and it's not deleted or somehow rectified, uh, that might be legal action that you can take against them, especially if there are damages. So all of that to say, David, swinging all the way back around, and the reason why I outlined those four things is, if you've only got one account that's been deleted, that might very well be the one and only account on your credit report that fell into one of those four classifications. And the others are coming back from the data furnisher, aka creditor, as being verified in a way that, that satisfies the Bureau. So if Credit Versio, if, if you're not seeing a suggested reason that says error on it, it means that 
Crediversio is just taking a shot in the dark, a statistical shot in the dark based on millions of past disputes. It's doing the best that it can to get an investigation open in the hopes that as the creditor updates the information through the verification process or the dispute process, that maybe they'll do something that creates a problem on the account. If by round five, you're not seeing anything, that means the data furnishers, the creditors have done a pretty good job, <clears throat> excuse me, a pretty good job, pardon me, at verifying that the information is reporting as it should and that the Bureau is satisfied that the response from the data furnisher um, is correct. So regardless of, of what we want, um, you're going to have those those clients that see, and, and I've seen this for 12, almost 12 years, that is, uh, we have customers that, uh, in, in all credit repair, not, not just Credit Versio or, the, or the, 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 the company I company I worked for before, but even high-end credit repair companies, very white glove, very, very nuanced uh, ways of doing things. You're going to get clients that have, that get a lot of deletions because a lot of the accounts on their credit report uh, either were erroneous, outdated, incomplete, or unverifiable. And you're going to get clients where nothing happened. Maybe they have a small file. Maybe they've got a small credit report and everything is correct. It's very rare you see a big credit report where everything is correct. But usually the, the more things you have on there, the, the higher the probability of something, at least a couple accounts on there, not being verifiable. And we see those get deleted uh, pretty frequently. So, so David, really what I would do, is let me give you a couple of options. Um, so... Sometimes if you've gone through the dispute process, everything is coming back verified, um, then it's probably time to either do one or two things. You can uh, give it some time, give it about six months, see if those, those items will uh, get archived, and then, um, and then give it another shot. Um, that was a pretty common response for the first five and a half, six and a half years I was in this business where we did very, very granular full service manual credit repair and people, we come back and we, maybe we get 20, 30, 40% off, maybe nothing, maybe everything. But for those who didn't get anything deleted or as much deleted as, as you know, everybody hopes more would come off, we would tell them, hey, give it six months. Let, let the bureaus, let the creditor forget about you. Keep your fingers crossed that maybe that account gets archived in some way that makes it hard for it to be verified and then try it again. Or number two, if there are legitimate debts that you owe, and you want to satisfy them, then get on the phone with some of these creditors and see if you can make a deal, uh, negotiate it down, get it paid off, at least end that kind of adversarial relationship that you might have with with some of these creditors. It's it's not a good, and I'm speaking from experience. It's not a good feeling when you know you got money that you owe out there, regardless of how you feel about it. It's it's always a it always can be a, a contentious situation. Uh, let's see, David. Oh, another question from you. you. Used to be able to get off collections like portfolio recovery by disputing that I don't have direct contact with them and boom off. Now I guess it may be different. Well, no, it, it, there's nothing different about the dispute process. In fact, m much of the laws that were written that allow us to do this, are, they're 40, 50 years old. So that really isn't different. It, it all comes down to uh, that particular account with that particular creditor at that moment in time. So maybe they've got great, maybe they never had great documentation the first time with you know, either Midland or LVNV or Portfolio or whoever it is. It depends on where they bought the debt from. So there's a lot of elements that go into whether or not something is verifiable or not. So it, you can have tremendous success um, getting some things off, and then you can have no success getting some things off. But it's all predicated on what that data furnisher is capable of doing. And that's really what it comes down to. That one of the important things to keep in mind is, Nothing that you can say or do is going to make an account uh, erroneous, outdated, incomplete, or, or, or unverifiable. The account is either that or it's not. So it's all about what is the condition of that account at the time that you are disputing it. And that's really what it comes down to. And frankly, sometimes it just, <laughs> it just comes down to luck. Um, I mean, sometimes that's the, that, that's the answer. Uh, you are very welcome. Uh, Jenny, so far uh, I have 
one repaired item from TransUnion, one item from Experian, and three from Equifax. Anything that comes off is a blessing. I've also deleted one item from TransUnion, two items from Equifax, and my bankruptcy removed from all three. That's awesome. On round five, uh, Jenny, you might be done. Unless, like, I, I don't know, I'm not sure when you dropped on the call, but uh, or jumped on the call, but one of the things I was saying uh, just a few minutes ago was, if you, when you're into round five, round six, and you are looking at the suggested reason that Credit Versio is promoting, or offering, I should say, and if it doesn't have the word error in there, it means that Credit Versio is not finding any discrepancies between the bureaus. And by that time, by round five, Credit Versio has a tremendous amount of data about that account because now it's got five credit reports to look back on. And the, one of the amazing things about the Credit Versio uh, software, the technology, is when it brings in a credit report, it doesn't scrape the data, it doesn't copy it, it actually recreates it as a digital ledger. So, and, and it lines everything up. It makes sure everything is, it, all accounts are lined up where they're supposed to go. This is especially important when you've got like student loans, you might have 20 of them. You see that all the time. So Credit Versus has got to make sure everything is all lined up, creates a digital ledger, so that when the next credit report comes in, round two, it takes all that data and puts it right on the ledger, lines everything up, and then goes through all the data to see if there's a discrepancy. It's actually fascinating. The the amount of algorithms that run to 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 watch that happen or to make that happen is pretty phenomenal. So it is going to catch anything that's a problem with that account. Now, by the time you're in round five, six, and it's not seeing anything, it means there's nothing there. It means, it means that data furnisher is probably doing a pretty good job at making sure that everything is lined up the way that it's supposed to be. And then from there, as I was saying uh, to David a second ago, if, if you're in round five, you're not seeing anything that says error, you're probably done. We don't really see a, a, a high volume, a high percentage of deletions after five. Because for the most part, everything that can be deleted probably has been deleted. And if there is a new error, Credit Versio is going to let you know, and it'll write a dispute reason specific to whatever that error is that it finds. Uh, great question, great comment. Scott, can furnishers re-report after an item came off the report from an inaccurate disp uh, dispute letter? It depends. Um, here, It's called a reinsertion, and it happens every now and then. So the, the, the creditor has 30 days to perform an investigation. Now, sometimes if they, and this, this is why it doesn't happen very often. Going back maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was a different story because there was more, there's a lot more manual work that was done. Now, a lot of things are, are automated. Software is a lot more sophisticated. So, so furnishers don't usually have to take a long, long time to perform uh, an investigation and get back to the bureaus. Usually that happens within 10 days, two weeks sometimes. So, but if there's an occasion where it, it's something maybe a little outside of the norm and they're not sure that they can complete the investigation in that time, then they will delete it. But having said that, there's no law that says once they delete it, they got to leave it deleted. That, that that doesn't exist. That's a, that's a big misconception that exists in this, in this environment or that, well, they deleted it, so it's got to stay deleted. No, that's that's not true. They can delete it, but if they go outside the timeline, they do verify it maybe the next month. They're like, oh, no, this is accurate. We did take it off. Now we're going to put it back on because we verified that it is accurate. And like I said, it doesn't really happen that often because we would see that on Credit Versio, but it does happen on occasion. Okay, uh, let's see. Additionally, 11 inquiries on TransUnion, 16 inquiries on Equifax, and 7 on Equifax. That's great. Um, one thing, uh, not not to do. Um, let's see. How would I? Uh, not to be self deprecating in any any way, Jenny. But uh, one of the things we see a massive amount of inquiries come off. Um, it, Credit Versa doesn't really do anything all that special with inquiries because it's just a different kind of animal altogether. The, largely, when people go, "Oh my gosh, I got all these inquiries off." Look at the date, and if you see that that was that the inquiry date was. Two years ago, sometimes that's the reason why it falls off. So as much as we'd like to take credit for it, sometimes inquiries just fall off on that. You know, they just fall off on their own. Not sometimes, they fall off on their own um, all the time at 24 months old. So that eh, can happen. Okay, great question so far. So what I wanted to, to show you, and I'm really surprised. I the, the, the questions that I'm getting, 
are really about going into the deeper rounds of disputes. And uh, I, I wanted to give you some encouragement. Now, again, sometimes it, it it's all just a shot in the dark. It depends on how inaccurate the information is or if it's verifiable. But I want to show you some stats. Now, one of the things that we do pretty frequently is, let me see if this comes up, is we do deep dives into our database. And I want to share some information with you that will encourage not necessarily Jenny and David, because you guys have done a great job going through the process. But for those who are watching or are going to watch the replay, I want to impress upon you how important it is to go into the, the later uh, phases or the later rounds of the dispute process. So since we launched in, in March of 2020, we've had a little over uh, 375,000 people create a credit versio account. It's a lot of accounts. And at any given moment, there's roughly about 35,000 active uh, users that are going through the various rounds of the dispute process. So about 35,000 people are going through that journey. Now I want to show you something real quick here. First, on the left, let me click the screen here, make sure you can see it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, perfect. Great. Okay, so on, on the left side right here, these are, uh, these are the stats for people just doing one round of disputes. Now, again, this is taken over. This, these are not, this is not an individual because individuals may have wildly different um, uh, uh, results as they go through the process. This is looking at our entire database of active users. So those who did uh, one dispute, this is by Bureau. So the Bureau is right here. Hopefully you can see this pretty well. I know it's, it's a little bit small. It's the account type right here in the center. And what was the deletion rate? Now, just one round across the, uh, the whole Credit Versio ecosystem here. For Equifax, collection deletions were about 30%. 10% on public records, large that's bankruptcies, and then uh, uh, almost 13% on trade lines. That's charge-offs and late payments. Now, the aggregate, about 16%, 15.9%. Uh, on Equifax, uh, excuse me, Experian, we just did Equifax, 41% um, deletion on collection, so quite a bit better than Equifax. 7% uh, on public records, a little bit less than Equifax. And then uh, trade lines 11%, so pretty close to Equifax. Then TransUnion, so uh, for an aggregate of about 20%, just shy of 20% deletion. So we're about 16%, 20% deletion. And down here, just to save the suspense, about 21%, almost 22% deletions on TransUnion. This is after one round. Well, what happens, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is, is this, and, and congratulations to to everybody who is going through the dispute process that's, that understands it's, it's multi-round. The, the challenge that we see sometimes, and again, maybe it's just the mentality of going into the credit repair process is we see people do one round of disputes and they're like, oh, I didn't get anything deleted or I got one thing deleted. Oh, this doesn't work. I, I, I got to go do something else or I'm going to quit or I'm just going to bury my head in the sand. We see that a lot. And I think too, this is, this is my, you know, this is, my belief, I don't know if this is factual or not, but a lot of things that take place seem to lean towards this being factual. A lot of people who do a dispute will receive a response. In fact, I, I even put this in the, in the quick start videos because it's, it's such a major thing. They'll get a response that says the information has been reported to be, or the information is reporting accurately. So when you do that round one dispute and you get that response back from the Bureau saying, oh no, everything is looking good, everything is reporting accurately. A lot of people quit because they don't really know what to do next. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about people on Credit Versio, people who are maybe sending in their, their own dispute letters or they hired somebody to fix their credit. And they're like, ah, this is a waste of time. I paid money or, or whatever. And I got this result back from the Bureau saying that everything is fine. What do I, I, I quit. And, that, and I think that might be one of the reasons why the bureaus and creditors send that kind of, of response back because they know the majority of people are just going to walk away. Like, I gave it a shot. Nothing happened. So let me give up on it. Um, uh, Ezekiel, hopefully I'm saying that uh, right, is the first dispute to correct addresses, job name, et cetera? No, not, not necessary. Um, that is a, a substantial myth that exists in the credit repair space. This is a myth that is 
perpetuated largely by credit repair people. Um, we've debunked this so many times. The bureaus have debunked this so many times. So there's this belief, and um, Ezekiel, I'm going to make the assumption that the reason why you asked this question is that there is this belief that if you remove old addresses and fixed names, that somehow that's going to disassociate yourself from your creditors, making it more successful in the dispute process. That is 100% patently false. Uh, you, there's no way to disassociate yourself from your creditors by changing things in what's called the PII section. That's the, the personal identifiable information. Uh, Equifax alone, and the reason why I know this is because uh, when my guest, John Alzheimer, joins me, he spent many, many years at Equifax in dispute resolution. And he's told me many times that Equifax alone has over 30,000 permutations of ways to connect you to your, your creditors. So changing a an address or getting rid of an address does nothing. There's no way to, to, to disassociate yourself. So no, if you want to do that just for the sake of having some, some um, uh, you, you know, just have clarity on your credit report, then, um, then you can do that. Uh, no, it's not step one. It's not even a necessary step. I wouldn't even, we have a document inside the resources section where you can't update your personal information. You can do it if you want to, but uh, it's it's not really anything that's necessary. Uh, does having multiple addresses hurt your score? No, nothing in your in the PII section of your credit report has anything to do with your score. Your score is all based on uh, information on your credit report. So your trade lines, collections, inquiries, those are the things that play a role in your score. Um, see, such as uh, move three times in five years. No, it has nothing to do with your score. I wouldn't worry about it. So what you and I see, Scott, we see what's called a consumer uh, credit disclosure. We call it a credit report, but that's not really what it is. A credit report, which I've never seen and you've never seen, a real credit report, that, that's the the uh, comma delimited, I can never say that word, uh, document that is with the bureaus is a sensationally massive document. Everything that we've ever done is on that. Even though we see you know, things drop off our credit report, on a, on a real credit report, nothing is ever removed. There's just data that is suppressed. And in there, every address we've ever been, every place we've ever worked, all, all the data that's been contributed is there. We see a very abbreviated version of that. And I wouldn't worry about having multiple addresses on the credit report. It doesn't, it doesn't affect anything that's, uh, that's score related. Okay. Zico, I hope that, uh, hope that answers your question. Okay. Let's go back to the stats here, because I want to show you what happens, and we'll, I'll, I'll cover this uh, five to eight percent here in just a second. But I want to show you what happens across the board, across our data, when people go at least four rounds of in, of uh, disputes. Usually, this is about four, maybe about five rounds. We do see deletions happening in round five, not a lot of them. For the most part, what happens as far as the deletion goes, as far as the, 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 the larger percentage is, is round two, three, and four. That's where most of the action takes place. But look what happens. Let's go to Equifax. Collections go from, go from uh, about 31% to 65%. They over double in versus one round versus round four. Public records, again, over doubles. Trade line more than doubles, goes from about 12, 13, almost 13% to 32%, not quite three times, a little less than three times the success rate. That's late payments and charge off deletions. So we go from about 15, about 16% to 38% deletion across, you know, across our database. For Equifax, collections, they go from 41% to 68%. Not as big of a jump, but we're, we're kind of closing in on 70%. That's where this number right here is going to come into play in a second. Public records goes from 7% to 21%, almost 21%. Late payments, charge-offs, 12% to 29%, more than double. So you can see all the success doubles as long as people go through that dispute process. Now, again, there are some who get far more than this there are some who get far less it just depends on what's on the account and what the creditor has to say about it coming down here to transunion 66 percent 
from from almost let's just call it 40 percent to almost 67 percent incredible eight percent to 21 percent trade lines 14 percent to almost 32 percent so a 38 percent deletion on equifax from 16 percent from 20 percent to 40 percent from 20 call it 22 percent to 43 percent so so this is the the power of going through the entire process. Okay, so what does this greater than five to eight percent mean? So here's so here's one thing that we that we suspect. We know what's going on as far as the dispute process. We know that what credit versity is finding. We know the dispute reasons, and we can tell when people create their dispute letters. The thing that we can't know is whether or not that client printed that letter and mailed it. And we know that there's a pretty good pro, there's a pretty good chunk of people that just don't do it. And we can't account for that. There's, that. That's an unknowable metric for us. So we assume just we have some metrics in-house that we rely on that we think are very reliable. And our guess is that these numbers are probably low by about five to eight percent. So in some instances, we can see like maybe with TransUnion, the overall deletion rate and maybe even Experian might actually be after round four closer to 50% as far as the aggregate goes. We can certainly see it in the point increases across the board for, for users. So that, that would explain what might be uh, what might be happening in the, in the background. Um, uh, Ezekiel, yeah, well, l listen, what Crediversio does sensationally well, better than people, and one of the reasons why there's a handful of really big credit repair companies that license our technology to do the processing for all their full service customers because they recognize that Crediversio's AI is far better at diagnosing and, and addressing problems on credit reports than human beings are. So I've looked at probably 20,000 credit reports in my career. I've done a lot of customer service too, and, and meaning looking at this month's credit report and comparing it to last month's credit report and the credit report before that and figuring out what happened. Well, you know, wh where was the change? Is there a discrepancy? So it's a really, it's a really pain in the butt process, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, it's hard. It takes a long time. Um, you're not always going to, you're not always going to find what's wrong, but the so what credit versus software is, is fantastic at doing that. So does that, so if you want the highest probability of the best results, go to round four, complete round four, and look at your suggested reason at round five. When that fifth credit report comes in, go through and, and you've, you've gone through the process, so you, so you know how it works. It's not complicated. If you see dispute reasons that are, are not specific and they don't have an error, you're probably done. And rather than you know staying on and continue to dispute, what I would do, and and uh, uh, th this is the the best advice I could give. This is what I did. This really helped me come through and, and do better with my credit repair. Is uh, I too I went five rounds. I think I might have gone six because there was something on mine. I can't remember. It's been eleven years, but uh, I had about thirty, uh, about forty, thirty five to forty percent of the the items that were disputed for me came off. Uh, I. I attribute a lot of that to the fact that I came to the repair process pretty late in the game. Most of my stuff was already old. I, I buried my head in the sand for years. Uh, I would my, my credit went south during the, the whole Great Recession. I was a real estate guy. And even though I didn't have much in the way of foreclosures, I had a lot of credit card debt because that's how I was funding a lot of the flipping, uh, a lot of things that I was uh, doing back in the day. So I did, I was successful at selling uh, all of my properties except for my primary residence, which did foreclose. Uh, but I was left, I, cause I kept pushing off paying off the debt. I was just left with massive credit card debt. So I buried my head in the sand for probably three years or so. And so by the time I got to credit repair, the stuff on my report was pretty aged. It was over two years, three years old. So that, I think that contributed to the higher percentage of, of accounts coming off, but still, there are some things I settled and so we disputed, like I'll give you a great example. Macy's was one of them. Disputing Macy's was really, really hard. Um, they never sold that debt. 
to a third party collection company they, they maintained as a charge off with a balance. And man, they would send me packets like that thick that had all of my statements. So they, they, they were not going anywhere. So I eventually, and it wasn't a lot of money too. They, I, they eventually settled with me. It didn't come off my credit report, but it was a zero, a zero balance. Didn't reage it. Doesn't work that way. Didn't stay on longer because I paid it. Um, and eventually it, it, it dropped off, but that was one of the things that had to, to age off. And then there were a couple of collections that I, I, um, I settled and were deleted, not, not because I asked them to delete it, but because I went around and disputed it again. And one of the things that, that a lot of people will find success with is if you, if you do settle a collection, um, just assuming it's legitimate, it's, let's just say that it's yours and you can get them to settle. And let's say it's one of these bigger collection companies that isn't going to delete it. Um, I know there are a handful that say they won't, and there are a lot that's, that will. But let's just say it's a, a collection company that will take the money, they'll zero it out. They're like, listen, we can't delete it. They're actually forbidden uh, from deleting it. It's right in the credit reporting resource guide that's uh, from the CDIA. That's the Trade Association for the Bureaus and for Data Furnishers. And it, it actually stipulates in there not to delete past credit uh, derogatory accounts in exchange for payment. But they do it all the time. Uh, but one thing does happen. Once collections are paid and zeroed out, and this is advice I'd, I've given for a decade, is give it about 30 days and then swing back around and delete it. Oh, sorry, and, and dispute it. And one of the things that happens pretty frequently is when you dispute that account, they still have to go through the whole verification process. That, that's right out of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And what happens a lot of times is, and they kind of, you know, like a wink and a nod. They know what you're doing. They know you paid the debt. They know you're disputing it. They know that they have to respond to it. And a lot of times they just don't. And they don't respond to it. And a lot of times the bureaus just delete it because uh, because the collection company never responded. Uh, let's see, Scott, does zero balance settle debt on a, on a charge off improve your score? No, not on a charge off. Um, it will on a collection, however. So and this is a very important distinction. All the contemporary models of FICO. So this is FICO 8, 9, 10, and 10T, and Vantage score 3.0 and 4.0. So this is the this is the bulk of the scoring models that are used today. In fact, that's the entirety of the scoring models used today, with the exception of mortgage, which uses the old FICO 2, FICO 4, the old um, the old 20-year-old FICO scores that that don't care if your collection is paid or not. Now that's gonna change here in about 12 to 18 months where FHFA mandated that the new FICO score is gonna be used. So we're gonna see a combination of scores. We're gonna see uh, FICO 10T and Vantage score four. Both of those scoring models are gonna be used to, to determine mortgage scores. That's great news, by the way. It's gonna be fantastic news for people who are, um, are wanting to buy a home to whatever degree that's happening in a year from now. We'll see what goes on with the economy. But currently, if you have a zero balance on a collection, Scott, those are ignored. They're cosmetically there, meaning you can look at your credit report, you can see that the collections are there. But FICO 8, 9, 10, and 10T, gloss right over them. That They're not factored in your score. Same thing with Vantage Score 3.0, which is the, the common ubiquitous Vantage Score right now and also Vantage Score 4.0. So both of those Vantage Score models don't, don't care about uh, a zero collection. It's just looked over and not factored into the score. And by the way, before it goes in one ear and out the other, when I talk about Vantage Score, I don't know where the bad rap or why the bad rap continues to, to persist. Vantage Score is a real score and it is used billions of times every year. And I'm not talking about because it's a free score given out with say Credit Karma or your bank or you know or anywhere else. Th those billions don't include those free scores. Those include decision-making scores that are used by credit card companies, personal loans, largely it's credit card companies. So when you apply for a credit card, much to the surprise of people, sometimes even auto loans, that lender is going to look at your FICO score and they're going to look at your Vantage score. So big, big deal. Let's not dismiss Vantage score just because somebody might think it's less significant. 
be able, you can, and you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to believe me. You can, this is a very easy Google search. Just Google how many times Vanta score has been used in the last year for credit decision making. I think you'll be surprised at how, how often it's being used now. And it's, and it's gaining more and more traction for a couple of reasons. Not everybody wants, lenders don't necessarily want to be held captive by a monopoly. So they don't necessarily want to always use FICO just because FICO is the, the, big, the big boy on the block. And also Vantage score is a darn good score. It accounts for a lot, uh, not so much anymore because the modern FICO versions are, are, are in some ways taking a lesson from Vantage score. But there was a time that Vantage score was so much better at predictive uh, analysis uh, with less data than what Vantage, uh, than what FICO score was. Meaning you might have like some, if you had a super thin file and you pulled a credit report and it was just FICO only, you might not have a FICO score because there wasn't enough data there for FICO to, to, to give any predictive um, and to run any predictive algorithm. Whereas Vantage score was able to do that. So Vantage score is a very, very good score. Um, and just, so just don't, don't, uh, don't disregard it. Okay. Where are we at now? About 40 minutes. So we're getting pretty close to wrapping up here. Uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to throw them at me now. Uh, be more than happy to answer them for you. Um, let's see, Scott, uh, let's see, Scott. So no reason to pay off or settle a charge off account. It's over four years, um, past, uh, the time for California. Yeah. So California, you, you're probably right. It's um, statute of limitations. The, the, the statute of limitations. This is for. Th this is for it being a time barred debt. So we're not talking about statute of limitations on how long it can stay on your credit report. A time barred debt means how long, per the state law, can that creditor sue you for for that amount? In California, you're probably right. It sounds about right. I think it is four years. Um, yeah. So there's no. Right. If it's been over four years, yeah, they're probably not going to come after you. Now they can't sell the debt to a collection company if they if they haven't already, and then it's a brand new collection. But but Scott, don't I, I wouldn't worry about that. As far as how the collection industry works, they're not really big on buying, you know, prehistoric debt. <laughs> what I mean by that is they they want to buy debt where they have a reasonable. Uh, expectation of payment or, or, or at least some probability of payment. And the way they look at it is, man, this is a four-year-old debt. The original creditor couldn't get it. Um, they're probably not going to get it either. So that they're, they're, it's very unlikely that the creditor is going to sell that off to a third-party uh, collection company. Uh, let's see. No, Scott, it, it will not. Uh, oh, it's Navy Fed. So yeah, it's a, it's a credit union. That, that's a whole different that's a whole different animal altogether. Hard, by the way, I will tell you this: small credit unions sometimes can be difficult to dispute and get things deleted because they, their their record keep, keeping tends to be pretty good, um, unless there's just something egregious and there there is a legit error there and they don't know how to fix it. Then you see deletions. I'm not saying it doesn't happen; it does happen, but it doesn't happen quite at the rate of like maybe you dispute at Citibank or. or uh, you know, or American Express. It's a different different animal altogether. Uh, but yeah, going back to answering your question, Scott, not a lot of uh, not a lot of the only benefit really to paying off a charge off uh, that's that old. Uh, there's nothing negative about it. It's not it's not going to hurt you at all. Uh, the the negative part that exists is if you go to buy something. For example, if you're going to buy a home. Um, the underwriter, maybe the mortgage broker might not say anything to you, if, especially if they're maybe a little wet behind the ears and they don't really know how things work. But that, but that underwriter who's going to be underwriting that loan for sure, they will not, they will not close escrow if you have an outstanding unpaid debt and they don't care what the time bar date is. Um, th they're not going to allow you to do it. They'll make you pay that stuff. Not in all circumstances. I know there's some exception. Dollar amount, I think, has a lot to do with it. But that's the only thing that I can think of. And also, too, to whatever degree you find it important to settle up old debts, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm of the belief, and I and I didn't do, and I didn't do this with all of my debts because I didn't quite have the, this this conviction at the time. But um, 
my conviction now is if you can pay it and if it's, you know, it is the right thing to do um, if you can. But, but again, this is just a personal philosophy of mine. People ask me, I will tell them this. You're free to make your own decision, whatever is going to work best for you. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of swinging back around and trying to settle debt if, if, uh, if possible. You are very welcome, Scott. You know, the thing that I love about doing these lives is I've been doing this stuff so, you know, 10, 11 years I've been doing this. I've had so many credit consultations, tens of thousands of credit consultations long before I joined Credit Versio. And I do miss it. I do like the questions. I, I do like keeping sharp. And and uh, it's a subject that, like, I wish somebody would have pulled me aside when I was in my late teens, early 20s and explained how credit worked to me. That would have saved me a lot of, you know, a lot of heartache. Uh, Juan, good to see you. What's the time frame? Uh, watch the time frame on a pre-approval loan. What's the time frame? I'm not sure what you're asking me, Juan. Try that one more time. Just be a little bit more specific as to what you're asking. Uh, let's see. Learn so much from you. Want to sell your platform to my clients? I wish we had something for you. We did have an affiliate program at one point, but it was just too difficult to manage, and uh, it just turned out to not be very cost effective for the you know limited hours in the day and the staff that we have. So maybe we'll come back around and do it again at some point. But I but I'm, I appreciate that and very flattered. All right, where are we now? We're coming up on 45 minutes. It is about quitting time. So if you're watching this on a replay, if I didn't get to your question, still feel free to post it. Uh, I do swing back around and answer these, but I think that's it for today. I'll give it just a second more because I see that strangely we got more people jumping on. So maybe they're getting off of work or whatever the situation is and we're getting some more questions, but I'll hang tight here for just a second. Um, here we go. Ah, Patricia, good to see you again. Being sued by one of my credit cards. Any advice going to court? Don't go to, yeah, I do have advice. It's next, oh, next month, plan on settling and don't so Patricia, yes, I'm glad you asked me this question because I can't tell you how many times over the last 11 years that I've had this kind of a conversation with somebody that I was doing a credit consultation with uh, when they were going through the credit repair process. The downside of losing is pretty bad, meaning um, it, when you go into court, and, and I actually have a lot of working knowledge on this because one of my good friends out here in Vegas is an attorney and he does this for a living. He works for a, a big collection company and he's the guy that files these uh, lawsuits and he's the guy that's going to show up in court. And if he shows up in court, it's going to be a bad day for you. Here's why. You're going up against clear documentation that the chances of you going to court and, and prevailing, unless there's just something that's egregious and you know it's wrong and you've got like a... Um, you know, you've got a, a you know some a great case, or you got an ace in the hole. You know, then then there's not going to be any surprises. This is not going to be like Matlock, or it's not going to be like an episode of Columbo or something where you're like, aha, this aha moment. But did you know this? What's going to happen is they're going to be they're going to lay out very methodically the debt. They're going to break it down in a way that's going to be very uncomfortable, and they're probably going to win. And when they win, that is a court judgment against you, meaning. That's, there's, there's nothing after that. That means they can garnish your wages and they can levy your bank account at will. It's a very, it's a very uncomfortable life. I, I am speaking from experience. It wasn't through a collection company. It was through a, a law firm from an old property. Remember, I, I, I used to have a lot of property and I was sued in absentia. I mean, they couldn't find me and they went to court and it was a default judgment. And then one day I look in my bank account, all my money's gone. And that didn't even settle all the debt either. That was a very uncomfortable situation. So what I would do, Patricia, and again, this is not legal advice. I'm not an attorney. If, you're, if this is a big concern of yours, I would speak to an attorney. If I was in a situation where I was getting sued, I would call up that creditor and I would make a payment arrangement. I do not want to go to court. A judgment is the absolute last thing you want. To, even if it's a dollar amount that I didn't agree with, I would try to negotiate it. I would try to, to, to do everything I possibly could to keep from going to court. That is bad news all day long. People who go to court, like this is the thing that kills me about like, you know, clowns that say, never pay a collection. Really? Never pay a collection? 
that's that's all well and good until you get summoned. When you get a um, a summons to go to court and you're in front of the judge and you got an attorney where that's all he or she does for a living. And you, it's like you're going up in a boxing ring with Mike Tyson. And if you've never blazed up before, it's, it's bad news all day long. I'm not, I'm not really deliberately trying to, to scare you, Patricia. I'm just letting you know that whatever you can do to avoid going to court, please do that. Okay. Uh, you're very welcome. Great to hear it. Okay. Any other questions? I'm about to jump off here. We're going to 50 minutes. That is uh, usually the timeline I like to stick to. And uh, yeah, Patricia, good luck with that. Just, uh, you know, try to get that settled up without getting a judgment because that's, uh, that's going to stay there for a long time. Uh, let's see. What if I had an arbitration agreement and has a, an attorney? Yeah, uh, that's a little outside of my scope of expertise. Yeah, if you're going to arbitration, that's different. Are you going to court or are you going to arbitration? Because that's a little bit, a little bit different. Um, yeah, yeah, they have an attorney. Yeah, right. If you're going to arbitration, there's still going to be an attorney there. So, um, again, if, if it were me, again, not legal advice, I'm not an attorney, but if it were me, uh, I would get on the phone and say, listen, how do we, how do we make this go away? I got this much money now. I can make this month, this kind of a payment per month. And fingers crossed that they'll deal with you because they don't have to. I mean, if, they, if it's full in default, um, yeah, okay. Just just be prepared. Um, you know, be prepared that if if it's a loss, if it's if you lose, because what's going to be different with arbitration? I mean, I don't I don't know anything about your situation, and again, I'm not an attorney. But the question you, I think that I would be asking myself is, do I owe the money? Um, is it is it? I might not agree with the fees, but I would go through all the terms and conditions and and see if what they're saying is accurate. And am I comfortable losing? Um, do I believe in it so much that I could go to court and I could, and, and I'm comfortable with with the fact that it can not go my way? But here's the th here's the thing too. I would be thinking. Anytime you're going to go into a fight, and that's really what this is going to be. Um, am I well equipped for this? You know, it, it, who am I going up against? You know, if it's just like if I'm going up against another, you know, amateur. Uh, or, or if I'm a professional and I got, and I'm going up against another professional, then I think I have an accurate way to assess what's going to go down. But if I'm an amateur and I'm going in against professionals who do this for a living, my default position is probably going to lose. How many times do amateurs go against professionals and win? Probably not that much. And that might not be the best comparison or best analogy. But for self-preservation, that's sort of the way that I, that I might look at it. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Great group. Great, great, uh, great questions. Always appreciate it. And I will see you next Wednesday. And we'll be back with John. We'll talk about credit building and we'll answer your questions live. Thank you so much. Good luck to you.